I am so happy to be here. It's really um, a pleasure to meet you all. Thanks, Tim, for inviting your students. Um, as Alexa said, I am uh, Lee First, your Twin Harbors Waterkeeper. I've been working in the, I work in the Chehalis Watershed, Grace Harbor, Willapa Bay, and all tributaries thereof. And so um, what waterkeepers do is they, they work for fishable, swimmable, drinkable water in their area. And I'm one of 350 waterkeepers all around the world. Um, the first water keeper was the Hudson River Keeper on the Hudson River in New York City. And they got together in the early 80s. Um, they, they were mostly fishermen who could no longer fish because the water was so toxic that, that, that the fish were dead. And so they, they got together with some um, attorneys and they got a lot of cleanup done from toxic waste sites and big polluters on the Hudson River. And, um, and the sites included like General Electric, big sewage treatment plants, you know, all kinds of chemical plants. And they, um, they got the sites cleaned up and the fishery came back. And then um, this water keeper movement was started. Um, so each one of us, 350 water keepers are a separate nonprofit. And um, I, I started working here in, in the harbor about two and a half years ago. Um, in our area, there's also a Puget Sound Keeper. There's a Columbia River Keeper, a Spokane River Keeper, a North Sound Bay Keeper, and a um, Snake River Water Keeper. So um, we had um, a, we have a two-year project. It's a public participation grant that that we were awarded from the Department of Ecology, and so they um, they 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 approved this presentation, but didn't necessarily endorse it. Um, and so I'm going to talk about um, some of the toxic cleanup sites that are in the harbor area and, and one site that's a little bit southwest of Chehalis, um, that, but it is in the Chehalis watershed. Um, so um, Washington has its own cleanup law. It's called the Model Toxics Control Act or MODCA. And it's Washington State's version of the Superfund cleanup site, which is the federal cleanup law. Oh, and I forgot to say, feel free to ask questions anytime. I love questions. And um, so um, don't worry about waiting to the end. And so some of the, the, the main aspects of this law are that in if possible, the state tries to get the polluter to pay for the cleanup. Um, the cleanups are usually negotiated over in a legal document called a consent decree. And the cleanups are supposed to be as permanent as possible. Um, there's places along or during the cleanup process where public participation is, is really important. And um, the cleanup processes should demonstrate a bias toward action, permanence, and in, in, innovation. And um, I love taking photos. Um, I, um, so I've tried to label most of these photos. And if, if you're from around here, which I assume you are, you, you probably know where these places are anyway. But th this is on the south side of the harbor, um, about a mile downstream of the 105 bridge. And so this is a site where um, a former sawmill called the Saginaw Mill was um, used to be here. It was, it stopped operation in about 1950 or 55. And this little tiny unnamed tributary here, th this is where um, a volunteer and I are doing our European green crab trapping. Lee, can I ask what it was from the mill that did the, the pollution here? What was responsible? Well, this, this is actually not on the cleanup sites. So okay. I'm gonna, um, this, th 
this is not a cleanup site. It's just a kind of an interesting slide. Gotcha. Yeah, but I've I've got um, I've got a whole bunch of I've I've got a list of eight 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 or nine sites that that, that I'm going to talk about in detail. Um, and so Modka's main purpose is to raise sufficient funds to address all hazardous waste sites and to prevent the creation of future hazards due to improper disposal of toxic waste into the state's lands and waters. And so th this is the same case. This is the Mayor Brothers Mill on the um, Coquiam River. And this is not a contaminated site. I just have it here because it's an interesting, you know, I, I really uh, pay attention to sites that are on, on the water um, because these kind of sites like this mill are required to have a pollution discharge permit with the Department of Ecology. So um, that those permits are spell out a bunch of criteria that, that these industries have to follow. Like they can't have a whole bunch of exposed waste. Um, um, dumpsters have to be covered. You know, they, they have to have best management practices to prevent stormwater pollution. They've got to have spill prevention plans and, you know, things like that. So, so again, this is not one of the hazardous waste sites. It's just an interesting site that's right along the water. Um, a, a toxic cleanup site is where one or more releases or threat of release of a hazardous or dangerous substances substance has occurred. And there are more, th more than 13,000 known or suspected contaminated sites in Washington. Uh, uh, probably 75% or between 60 and 75% of those 1,300 sites are relatively simple sites. They're like a gas station with a leaking underground storage tank or um, someplace that had like a heating oil tank that leaked or, you know, kind of a relatively simple problem. Whereas um, the rest of the sites are, are usually big industrial sites that have a lot of contamination of, of soil, groundwater, sediment or air. Um, this is the Weyerhaeuser Mill. This picture is the Weyerhaeuser Will on the Willapa River and it does have a contaminated site on it. And um, because it's not in Grace Harbor, I'm not gonna discuss it tonight, but, um, but it's really common that a lot of these older sites, um, do, you know, because these sites were all built before the Clean Water Act. And so, um, so back then there weren't laws that governed the disposal of, of hazardous waste. So, um, so that's just something to keep in mind. So how does a site get listed on, on, under the Model Toxics Control Act? There's a variety of ways. Often reports from the public regarding pollution observations lead to listing. Sometimes facilities self-report large spills or other problems. Once these reports are filed, the Department of Ecology does an in initial investigation, which results in a ranking. Um, and sites with a ranking of one are the most serious. Sites with a ranking of five are less serious. Not all sites are ranked or, you know, this whole process takes time. So there are some sites that, um, that don't have a, a, a rank yet. And, and so there's a whole cleanup process, uh, which looks like this. So this process can take many, many years. Um, the first step in the process is usually a remedial investigation where the site is kind of completely characterized. You know, all kinds of samples are taken groundwater sampling wells are drilled, you know, samples of soil, surface water um, are taken. And then um, all that information is usually kind of synthesized by a consultant. And then there's a feasibility study. And the, what the feasibility study does, it looks at several different alternatives to cleaning the site up. 
And the feasibility study usually has a, what's called a disproportionate cost analysis where they put some dollar figures to the different, um, different cleanup options. And then, and where these little orange bubbles are, that's where public participation is encouraged. So when there's a remedial investigation, the Department of Ecology puts out a fact sheet and um, advertises in the local paper and puts it on their website that they're looking for comments on the remedial investigation. And then they look for comments on the feasibility study. And then after they get the comments, the comments are incorporated and then they come out with a cleanup action plan where the preferred alternative is um, elaborated on. And then after that, an engineering design is completed. And then finally, the, the site gets cleaned up. And then after the cleanup, in almost every case, there's ongoing monitoring. Like they have to sample the groundwater, sample the surface water, sample the soil, just, just to make sure that the, the, the cleanup alternative was effective. Oops. I'm going to go back. Yeah. Um, so this is a site that is on the toxic cleanup list. And <laughs> this is another site that, you know, obviously it's still running. But back when it was the Weyerhaeuser mill, they, they had some contamination. And, um, and there's soil contamination and some groundwater contamination there. And, um, and it's really complicated because, because it's an ongoing site that has you know, a lot of process water discharge to the, the, the um, stormwater treatment ponds and um, wastewater ponds that are both on the south shore of a river and right along the site, you know, between the kind of along the, the Blue Slough Road. Um, so these are the sites that I'm going to talk about. These are the sites that are rated number one or the most serious in Grays Harbor County. In, in yeah, in the lower harbor, uh, plus number eight, that is the Hamilton Labrie groundwater contamination site that's um, on the outskirts of Chehalis. Uh, so this first site, IDD1, it's also called Dyke Access Road Repair. It's in Hoquiam. It's a 45 acre site. It's a little bit, you can see, you can kind of get your bearings here with the picture. You can see the, um, the grain terminals at the Port of Grace Harbor there in the distance. Um, so this site is, it's 45 acres along the waterfront in the city of Hoquiam. Um, it past uses at this site include a shingle mill with associated drying kilns and a lot of fuel storage tanks. A 1928 map shows buildings on piles with surrounding areas filled with refuse and fuel and fish oil tanks with a refuse burner nearby. And then in, in the 1970s, um, the dredging from the navigation channel, they piled a whole bunch of dredge spoils on top of the site. So um, dredge spoils are sometimes contaminated too. Although when they do dredging, you know, I'm not sure um, what, they, what exactly they did in the 1970s when they dredged. But when they dredge now, they have to sample, you know, they have to get a representative sample of the dredge spoils. And if they pass, if the dredge spoils are clean enough, then they go, they take them out past the Chehalis River bar and dump them at a deep water disposal site that's really not very deep and it's not very far away. Um, but back in the 70s, to be perfectly honest, I, I don't think they had to sample them. Um, so they just took the dread spoils and dumped it on top of what was already a what was a contaminated site. 
and those dredge spoils could have very likely been contaminated because of the industrial nature of the waterfront where there was, you know, back in the day, there was a lot more shipbuilding, you know, there were more mills, there were more, um, you know, all kinds of discharges from these industries. And when it was bef before the Clean Water Act, so there was very little regulation then of, of those businesses. Um, so what's at this site, um, what they, so they did an initial assessment at this site and, and they found um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and di dioxin in the soil and arsenic and a lot of metals in the groundwater. So di dioxin is a really, really toxic material that's um, often um, a byproduct of burning, like burning wood products or burning industrial waste or that sort of stuff. It's very, very toxic. And polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are also very toxic. They're basically like oil compounds and then arsenic and metals. So um, um, th this, I find this site especially interesting because the public walks here all the time. Um, I know people that walk here every day and there's no sign that says it's a toxic cleanup site that's ranked number one. And, um, um, and I think that should change. You know, it's owned by the port of Grace Harbor and it's a toxic cleanup site and people are totally unaware of, of what the potential hazards are here. You know, I think if you stay on the gravel road, you're probably fine. But, you know, I think of people letting their dogs run around here. And um, um, I, I would feel personally, I would feel a lot better about it if there was a sign there. So at least people knew that there might be some kind of potential hazard. Um, and even better would be if the site was cleaned up. And another fascinating thing about this site is, um, a couple of years ago when the port was trying to put a potash terminal in um, at terminal three, which is a little downstream of, of this site, um, this um, IDD1 was proposed as a wetland mitigation site for wetland fills at the proposed potash terminal. So um, I think, and so what they wanted to do was put, tidal channels back into this area for fish habitat. And, um, and I think there, you know, th there's something seriously wrong with that because you don't open up tidal channels in a toxic cleanup site unless it's completely cleaned up first. Um, so that's a little food for thought for you, I hope. And so do you, do you all see what I mean now? This isn't exactly a, a fun talk and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Okay, good. So this is another site you may or may not have seen. Um, this is Pakenham Boatyard. It's right next to the historical seaport. It's, yeah, it's adjacent to the seaport and just um, west of it. And, and today, this is what it looks like. Um, it's rated one the most hazardous. Um, so that um, historical seaport used to be the, the former Weyerhaeuser sawmill, and it's also got some contaminated issues, but I'm not gonna talk about that. It's not rated one. Um, and it's right next to the, to the public boat launch uh, that's owned by the city of Aberdeen. So this boat yard, you know, back in the 1890s, um, Grays Harbor, you know, for 50, 60 years, Grays Harbor was a center for shipbuilding. And so this, um, this site was used as a boat yard or built building and repairing boats since 1890. And um, boat, boat building, especially back then, you know, all boat yards, there's a lot, a lot of contamination that came from boat yards back in the day. You know, because boat paint uses copper, you know, there's lead 
um, weight, there's lead on boats on the hulls to prevent um, degradation of, of the other metal parts. There's, you know, copper and a lot of copper and zinc. Um, and, but, you know, the good news about boat paint is uh, Washington passed a law a couple years ago that really, um, that prescribes that boat paint cannot have that many toxic ingredients. But uh, things like copper and zinc are just deadly to salmon. And so when I think about a site like this, I think, you know, the Chehalis in most years has healthier, better fish runs than any other river in Washington. But they have to go through this area to get upriver to spawn. So it's like, it's kind of like running the gauntlet, you know. Um, and then, you know, all these pilings are creosote, um, which do, I'm going to try not to talk, you know, I'm, I'm a little, don't let me talk, don't get me started on creosote because I can spend two hours talking about it. But creosote is a poison and it just leaches out. And, you know, these things have been here for, these pilings have probably been here for at least 50 years, leaching out. So this boatyard um, is obviously in disrepair. It's no longer functional. It was abandoned, I, I think, in the, in the early 80s. And several investigations have been conducted at the site and have confirmed that copper, mercury, nickel, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, organotins, semi-volatile organic compounds, dioxins, and polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs, which is, you know, here's the dioxins and the PCBs, those are really, really nasties, are present in the soil and the sediments. Um, and I believe this site, you know, there's redevelopment plans for the historical seaport, although they haven't moved ahead in several years. It's kind of at a standstill for some reason because it's kind of in the city of Aberdeen's hands. And so if, if that moves forward, you know, there's plans that, that this will also be redeveloped, but it has to be cleaned up first. Lydia, uh, I have a question for you. Oh, sure. You mentioned that salmon in their runs go right through this area. Yep. Is this an issue more of when we start to clean it up that we're going to be releasing a bunch more toxins? And is it kind of like asbestos? If you leave it alone, it's not going to bother anything? Or is it constantly leaching into the water? Well, I think both. Like creosote um, is, is really problematic. When they pull out pilings and, you know, Grace Harbor has more pilings than I've seen anywhere. And I'm 64 and I paddle all the time in all kinds of places. And I've seen a lot of pilings, but I've never seen as many as here. I've never seen a quarter as many as here, but a lot of them are not creosote, they're cedar pilings. Um, and you know, cedar pilings last a long time, but they're not toxic. They don't last as long as, as creosote, but when when you try to remove a creosote piling, you know it often breaks off, and or it does release a bunch of the contaminated mud around it. So, you know they do have procedures for that, and they um, they're very careful when they remove these kind of things. But but you know I think what needs to happen here is some of this the worst contaminated sediment needs to be taken out because it's or it is going to keep continue leaching you know forever and um in bellingham there's a bunch of boat yards that were very contaminated just like this and so what they did there was they you know they characterized the sediment they had a pretty good idea of how deep down it went and on a couple of the sites you know the worst contamination was like a foot a foot deep and so what they did was they very they they put up what's called silt curtains or you know um, kind of they're like plastic curtains that prevent sediment from moving around. And so they you, you can put up a silt curtain and then you know very carefully dredge away like at low tide dredge away the that top foot of the most contaminated sediment and then put down. 
a clean, like a clean clay liner. And, and so there's, you know, that's a very valid point, but there are, you know, they've been, this kind of cleanup of these kind of sites has been going on since, since the eighties. And so, you know, that's a pretty long time. And so, and there's also ways to dredge that, that are a lot, that do a lot less soil disturbance than other methods. So, um, so that, that, that's a great question. And, and so when you read the documents like the cleanup action plan, you, you know, there might be 50 pages about how exactly how they're gonna do it. And, and, and that's a great time for people to comment and say, you know, are, is this method gonna prevent stirring the material up and getting it back out into the river? Is that a good enough answer for you? Perfect. Okay, cool. All right. um, this is a site in Hoquiam. It's called Butcher's Scrap Metal. It used to be an automobile wrecking yard in a heavy equipment wrecking yard. And you can see um, it's surrounded by a chain link fence. Um, it's right around the corner from a couple of the shake mills that are um, kind of in Hoquiam between terminal, between IDD1 and terminal, terminal three, which is the giant uh, chip pile um, out by um, the bird sanctuary. So, so this site, that, that um, material you see kind of in the middle of the picture, that's shredded metal and um, and it's been there for years. So, um, so this site is ranked one. It has con confirmed contamination of petroleum products such as heavy oil, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs that are above the Modka cleanup levels in soil and suspected PCB contamination in surface water. So this um, butcher scrap and metal business operated at this location since the early 70s. It currently houses a couple of abandoned sheds, abandoned he heavy machinery, and these piles of shredded metal and solid waste and a bunch of wrecked vehicles. Um, given the nature of a wrecking yard, the entire area of the wrecking facility, um, well, it was about two acres of, of ground that's pretty severely contaminated. And almost the whole site is, ha, has been shown to be um, contaminated with used oil. Um, and no cleanup has begun. Lee, I got a quick question for you. Oh yeah. Um, with the presence of PCBs, um, is there any signage warning the public of, um, you know, potential cancerous causing uh, effects? No, there's no signs at any of these sites. And okay. you know, this site is kind of off the beaten trail. You have to go down a gravel road. Um, uh, yeah, I was just curious. The only reason why I asked is because I've, I've been affiliated with, a, with an organization where we used to have to list things that had uh, PCBs or potential. Right, right. I'm and, just curious. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, I think that would be really important at that IDD1 site because so many people use that to walk. And, you know, um, I can't remember now if it has PCBs, but it has dioxin, which is probably the worst. And, and, and so that's one thing I'm gonna try to do in the next iteration, if, if I get this public participation grant, I'm gonna try to get some signs up in some of these places where people walk. You know, I, I don't know if I'll be successful because, um, you know, well, the port of Grace Harbor owns that IDD1 site. And I don't know if, you know, I, I can see reasons why they wouldn't want to have a sign there. And maybe um, just asking to put a sign, you know, I don't want to cut off public access to that site either. So it's going to have to be a very carefully approached process. 
Um, this is another boatyard. It's called Berg's Marine Construction and Repair. It's located on the Hoquiam River. Um, you can see it from the bridge when you go over the, um, I forget the name of that bridge, but it is also the site of an operating boatyard called the Shipyard LLC. And so that the that current occupant there, the shipyard, has a pollution discharge permit with the De Department of Ecology because they are doing ongoing work. They they do some sandblasting. They do um, a, a bunch of you know processes to repaint boats or repair. So when you do that kind of activity, um, you need to get you know you're required to get this permit a boatyard um, pollution discharge permit from the Department of Ecology. So they have the permit, but it's just really interesting that they're operating on a site that is a contaminated site, um, and, it, and it's been on the model toxics control list since 1995 and it hasn't been cleaned up and it's then there's hardly been any investigations um and it is suspected to contain contaminants typical to boatyard operations and soil groundwater surface water and sediment such as tributyl tin and copper and zinc um yeah let's see yeah, the site, and um, there's a really interesting um, mapping site that the Department of Ecology has. It's called What's in My, What's in My Neighborhood. And I'll, I'll put a link to it in, in the chat at the end, but um, it's a really good mapping tool where you, know, you can put in a zip code or a city or a county, and then the, the map zooms over to that area and it shows all the the model toxics control act sites in the in that area and you can zoom in and out and then you can click on the dots and and um and it'll take you to the department of ecology website where you can see you know the status of the site and if any cleanup documents have been written and that sort of thing um this is another site in hoquiam this is called apex environmental it's on south adams in hoquiam um the past operator of this site uh, was involved in oil recycling and hazardous waste storage the site has confirmed soil contamination and is listed as having um suspected groundwater and surface water contamination um it's been listed as a modca cleanup site since 2011. Um, it's listed on the Department of Ecology um, website as a waiting cleanup. Um, and there's no cleanup documents available on the on the website. Um, that's pretty much it for the good news in in Grace Harbor. Um, you know, I'm just going to go back to this one. So um, I've worked in other areas. I, I did this kind of work in Bellingham where there was a lot of actual cleanup happening. And I did this kind of work in Spokane where there, you know, there's a little less cleanup there, there but um, there is some progress on some of these sites. And what I would really like is to get, you know, is for the Department of Ecology to start taking some cleanup steps and I think it's it's um, it's going to be some more time till it happens. But I think the more people that learn about this, um, you know, we what I think we need to do is talk to our legislators and you know, just reinforce the need for starting some cleanup here because we have a a really um, a lot of industrial legacy here that you know there's a lot of sites that are just sort of abandoned and and they're contaminated and you know they're going to keep leaching they're going to keep exposing people there's a lot of um some of these sites are near schools or you know the walking area one and you know there there needs to be some action so i i hope that learning about this um 
has been interesting to you guys. And, and maybe at some point we can, you know, if there is some cleanup started, we can um, get some folks to comment at public meetings or, you know, provide written comments. Um, and I have a that, question, Lee. Oh, sure. So with all of these cleanup sites that have been identified, yeah. hypothetically, they've gone through that initial remedial investigation phase. Oh, almost none of them have. They've had an, oh. yeah, they've had a site assessment, which is uh, kind of a bare bones thing. Very so is, the, is yeah. the lack of action then, is the lack of action due to legislative ignorance yeah. lack of funds lack of awareness it's lack of funds and i and i think this area is sort of out of mind you know it's not puget sound <laughs> and um and a lot of the funding you know i call it puget sound centric there's 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 more people there there's so there's more funding and there's um you know d different kind of atmosphere like there there's more people that want the cleanups um and and so i talked to the department of ecology toxic cleanup staff you know i'm kind of a professional pest like i i want to get something done here you know that's why i'm doing this job i want to get some of these i want to have some cleanup here and when i talk to the 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 staff on in the toxic cleanup program at ecology they say oh you know we're overworked you know we don't have enough staff you know we don't have enough funds so um somehow we need to tackle that problem you know i think a really good start would be to talk to our legislators about it um so but but there's a bright spot here so this is a really cool site. Uh, this is actually an EPA site. It's in, um, it's in the Chehalis watershed. It's a, uh, about um, a mile and a half southwest of the downtown Chehalis. It's immediately west of the freeway. Um, it's called the Hamilton Labrie Groundwater Contamination Site. Um, there was an industry here called Breen Industry that in, um, in around the, the 60s, they had some kind of industrial facility here that, um, that used degreasers and, you know, I think it was a machine shop. And so, um, so they, um, a bunch of groundwater drinking wells in this area, all of a sudden in the early 90s started to be um, really contaminated, like the, the water smelled, you know, the water tasted bad. And so the State Department of Health did a bunch of testing and they found that the, um, the groundwater was, was grossly contaminated with a chemical called tetrachloroethane or PCE, which is a chemical that's also used in dry cleaning. And it's, um, and, and it's used in metal degreasing and other industrial processes. So what they found out was the, um, the owner of that business, Breen and Company, buried over 255 gallon drum, drums of spent PCE under a building. And so that PCE leaked into the soil and then into the groundwater, which is kind of shallow here. And in this area, the, the, the groundwater flows west and northwest across the New Wacom River Valley. So, so the contaminated groundwater plume was, it had already contaminated about 20 private drinking wells and, and it was moving west and northwest. So uh, a site like this is kind of taken with the most seriousness. And, and I think because it's contaminating people's wells, you know, it also contaminated this creek. You know, this, I, I can tell a short story about this creek. This is Bewick Creek and it's a tributary of the Newacom River, which is a tributary of the Chehalis River. So um, this creek used to meander 
through this property. But what the, um, the fix of this site is to actually heat up the soil and boil the groundwater to get rid of that chemical. So this is the start of that whole process, which happened last fall. Um, they, um, the first thing they did was they straightened the creek, which is just a temporary thing. Well, they took all the salmon out of the creek and then they straightened the creek and then they insulated the creek with a lot, with like a foot of foam. And then they put it in this um, artificial channel. Uh, so the foam is to protect it from the heat because all these pipes um, that, you know, this, is, this, this was the beginning of the process where they put deep pipes down into the groundwater so that they can pump them full of steam and heat. And um, because that's the only way to get rid of that PCE. And so now the site, um, so they worked on the site all summer and they connected all the, um, the steam pipes and they put in a gigantic generator and they put in a really elaborate system to um, treat the condensate. So the, um, the condensate from this whole steam treatment process is what has most of the contaminants in it. So now they have a whole treatment facility just for the condensate. And, um, and so they're gonna run this whole operation until I think late this summer. And then, you know, but they're always testing it and kind of calibrating it. And, and it's just a fascinating site. Um, and, and, and this is more good news. You know, I think whenever there's a cleanup, it's, it's a success story, you know? Um, and, and so the EPA, I actually, oops, I actually, um, I'm in contact with the EPA people who are um, kind of running this cleanup. And, you know, my opinion is this is so great and it's so fascinating that, that I wanna have a tour. And, and so they said, oh no, you know, we can't have a tour, COVID and all this. And I'm like, well, you know, we could be outside, you know, we could be, easily be six feet apart with masks on and, and all that. And, I'm, and, and they're like, oh no, you know, we'll do a tour, but it's gonna be a virtual tour. So it's coming up, it's gonna be on June 10th and anyone can go um, and you don't need to pre-register. So they're gonna spend an hour kind of explaining ex exactly kind of the history of this, um, how they went through the whole process of doing the feasibility study and the, and the um, cleanup action plan and you know why, why they picked this cleanup remedy and how effective it's, it's, um, it's being and, and that kind of stuff. So I really hope that you guys will consider coming. And um, because this, the, yeah. I noticed on there that that's a super fund. Is that in conjunction yes. with Washington's MTCA or is no, this just no, a super fund site? Yes, so this is a federal super fund. Th this is a federal cleanup site and it's being cleaned up under the super fund law. So the EPA is, is running this cleanup. And in all those sites that I talked about that are in in our area, those are being, those are state cleanup sites or model toxics control act sites. So the closest other EPA cleanup site we have around here is on the Macaw reservation, way up in um, um, La Push. And um, I think it's La Push. And so they have a really contaminated landfill up there and, and that's being cleaned up by the EPA. But almost all the other sites in, in you know, Grays Harbor and the Chehalis River are, are state cleanup sites. Um, yeah, and so that's pretty much what I had to say. Um, I want to put another plug in for this um, 
what's in my neighborhood mapping tool. It's really an interesting thing. Um, you, you know, you, you can you can bring up our area here and see it, it's just filled with dots and you can click on the dots and you can find out, you know, a lot of the sites are leaking underground storage tanks or, you know, sites that I didn't talk about. And then um, I did mention that some of the sites got listed as um, cleanup sites because people reported pollution. And so it's actually, um, there's a, a environmental report tracking system that's run by the Depart Department of Ecology. And if you do a Google search for environmental report tracking system, you'll find this statewide reporting form, um, or you can just email of something, some kind of pollution that, that you see or call, or you can call me and I'll report it. But if you do see some, you know, some pollution or some contamination that you're worried about, um, it's really good to take a picture and then get a good location of it. Um, and because that's part of what I do, you know, my job is to prevent pollution and and it's, it's a really fun job. I highly recommend it. <laughs> um, Lee? Yes. I'm curious on the one that was in Chehalis, it was EPA and then the one that Macaw's EPA. Yeah. What, what, how did they get designated EPA because they had something to do with drinking water or well, not state? I, you know, that's something that I'm really curious about too. I think the one in Chehalis got picked up by the EPA because it is, it's contaminating people's drinking water supply and it was on the move. And so I think EPA has more access to funding mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and they somehow can move quicker. And then on the Macaw site, so on, on a reservation, the state laws do not apply. So I think, um, and I'm not positive about this, but what I what I think is that because it's because the you know the Macaw is a, is a separate nation, and the state of Washington laws don't apply. So, like, and if there's businesses on the Macaw reservation, they don't have to get the state pollution discharge permits um, either. Um, they would have to get federal permits, but so I think that's the reason, and um, and that's a really good question. I just put in the chat the two links that you had put oh, up on your slides. The what's Great. in my neighborhood a link is first, and then the Ertz link is second. So if you guys want to take a look at those, they're in the chat. Great, thanks, Alexa, and um, if. Anyone, we send out a, a little e-news about twice a month. And if anyone wants it, I'd be thrilled to add you to the list. Um, right now, I, I'm doing a lot of work trying to stop a dam on the headwaters of the Chehalis River. So um, you you could sign up for the e-news and learn a little bit about that. And um, yeah. Yeah, if you guys wanna put your emails in the chat, I'll send them on to Lee. Yeah, if you'd like to. Alexa actually works with us on some really great uh, pollution prevention, like plastic, mostly. Yeah, yeah, we do a bunch of cleanups and um, especially of yellow ropes. I don't know if, if you walk on the beaches here. Have you seen some yellow ropes? Vince is 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 yeah. You've seen some yellow ropes, Vince. Yeah, I used to work on the on the tide flats for many years when I was younger and yeah, yellow ropes are everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're actually making some really great progress with many of the oyster growers to, um, so that they can stop, um, discharging those ropes. Um, yeah. I worked with the coast dead bird survey for about a year and a half and we picked up bags and bags and bags of yellow fragment ropes. Yeah. Well, in one day in January, Alexa and I and some volunteers picked up um, almost 17,000 individual ye 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 yellow ropes. And how many altogether have we picked up? 
We've picked up almost 86,000 yellow ropes. <laughs> and, I, and I can tell you when we started counting them, especially on that day in January where we, it took us longer to count them that day than it did to collect them. The shellfish growers that were there were wincing. You know, they, they, it was painful for them. And, um, but they're really working hard to change their practices. So mm -hmm. they deserve a lot of credit. Yeah. Tim, is it okay if I send you Grace Harbor Stream Team emails as well, or do you just want great, or do you just want Twin Harbor's Waterkeeper emails? Uh, I already get your your Stream Keeper emails. Okay, so perfect. I'm on that list. Good, <laughs> awesome. Thanks. My predecessor okay. added a lot of people to the list, so I don't have I don't know everybody on it. <laughs> so. Do you guys have any great questions tonight? Do you guys have any other questions? Lee, do you know of any uh, funding that's specific for um, MOCA sites in Washington? Like if there's any like Department of Ecology or? or... Yeah, so I think I, I was going to talk about that. Um, so the, the MOCA funding comes from a tax on toxic substances. So there's all kinds of stuff that's produced um, that is taxed with and earmarked for cleanup. Um, so there is fun, there are funds and, um, but it's a really complicated process, you know, how those funds get allocated and like, you know, so much funds get allocated for the Salish Sea and for places where um, people demand a cleanup or, or maybe, you know, they're drink contaminated drinking water sites or, um, you know, so, so there's a lot of aspects, which I don't fully understand how, you know, sites get chosen to get cleaned up. And, um, and it's important to remember that it has to go through that whole process of a remedial investigation, you know, a feasibility study and just those things, you know, those studies take years to do and yeah. they're very expensive. So, um, so I say, you know, cleanup hasn't started at any of these sites down here. You know, some of them have some cleanup documents, but they don't have any on the ground cleanup yet. Mm -hmm. So we just got to get really loud and annoying um, and bring a lot of attention to our area, like you're already doing, Lee. <laughs> well, you, you know, it's interesting. Alexa and I attend these habitat work groups for the Chehalis Basin Partnership, where they do, you know, a lot of major salmon restoration projects. And, you know, I, I did this presentation for, for them, and they had no idea, you know, that these, that the salmon, you know, the salmon that they're working so hard to protect upriver have to run the gauntlet down here. And, um, and so they, they wrote a letter to the Department of Ecology, you know, asking them to do a presentation. You know, they wanna know why the site, there hasn't been any actual cleanup on the ground down here. So I think it's the June meeting where someone's gonna, someone from ecology is gonna come explain it that and I'm sure as hell gonna be part of the audience there because I want to know. I, I, I've been trying to find that out for almost two years now. I'm excited that's I great news that they're coming to the June meeting. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that I am curious about is you know you had mentioned about the legislators and stuff. To yeah. me because of the salmon being such an issue yeah. for Washington state as a whole Yes. for the orca population for you know i mean fisher yeah. fishing everything i would think that um that that would be a really good direction for grace harbor yes because of our salmon runs and yep. if we could tap into our legislators yep to push for that yes that someone would have to listen sooner or later yes i'm i agree Yeah, I'm always afraid to launch into any kind of lobbying thing because I know there's a lot of rules about that, but um, I totally agree and I'm glad you said that. 
thanks everybody so much for joining us. Oh yeah, go ahead, Tim. I was just going to say it'd be interesting to see if um, when any of the salmon hatcheries do their removals at the end of the year, if they sample some of those tissues and those have any of the PFASs and all those yeah. other abbreviated toxic chemicals in their tissues, then that means it's getting into people eventually. And that might be a, exactly. a way to squeak the wheel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, they have done those kind of studies in, in the Salish Sea. And the salmon that come through areas like in Seattle, where there's a lot of stormwater pollution, do have some issues. And, you know, salmon are killed in some of the streams by, by stormwater. And there's been some really interesting kind of recent studies that show that, um, well, and warm, warm water um, and a bunch of toxics that are in stormwater kill, kill fish. So, mm -hmm. uh, Lee, I was curious, um, do you have local government support there in Grays Harbor? And if so, does it help on a bigger level to get attention? Um, I am in touch with the stormwater folks at the city of Aberdeen because this um, city of Aberdeen, any city that's over 10,000 people in population has to have a stormwater discharge, a, a municipal stormwater discharge permit. So they have to do certain practices. You know, they have to have a stormwater outreach and education plan, and they have to do things like kind of manage construction sites so that a bunch of silt doesn't get discharged into the river. And, you know, they, they have a bunch of things that they have to do to comply with their permit. And I am in touch with the city of, and street sweeping. You know, they, they do a lot of street sweeping. They have to map all their catch basins and their stormwater system, you know. And, the, and I have to give the city of Aberdeen stormwater staff some credit because they work hard and they they do care about this and and I would you know I've never actually you know point blank asked them if they support this kind of adv advocacy but I'm pretty sure they do uh, thank you